had uh, several deaths in the life of our body this week, and I need to say this to you, stop it. I was doing a funeral on Tuesday for Virginia Staley. Many of you know Royce. Uh, Royce died four or five years ago in Virginia. Been very, very faithful members of our body, longtime members of our body, and visiting with the family before the funeral. Um, of course, I knew from knowing Virginia that she loved the Lord, that she was uh, faithful to the Lord, and that she wanted others to know the Lord. You know, all of uh, Virginia's children know the Lord, all of her grandchildren know the Lord, her great-grands who don't yet know the Lord are being taught about the Lord. And when I, when I say her children and grandchildren know the Lord, I mean not just in name. I know them, have known them for years, and they walk with the Lord. Another thing about Virginia was that she um, consistently, when, when she met people, she was a people person, always interested in folks, always concerned. Many of you know that we would often start a Sunday morning service here, and she's still out greeting people in the crowd, so Royce would grab and drag her to her seat, but she was just a people person. And you know that everyone she met, the first thing she would ask them is, hey, where do you go to church? And a lot of folks came here because as she found out they didn't go to church, she would invite them here. Let me tell you why I mentioned that about Virginia. I was amazed to find out after hearing the kind of uh, legacy that she has left, I was amazed to find out that Virginia Staley was a woman whose parents didn't take her to church. She left an incredible spiritual legacy because, listen, a neighbor invited her and took her to church. A neighbor. Can I remind you, as we are praying through your one and praying for you, can I remind you of the importance of the ask? A neighbor invited her, and a neighbor took her to church, and because of that, her life has left an incredible spiritual legacy of many who are now following Christ because of her. Let, let me mention a second thing very quickly, in case you don't know this. We're in the second month of the year. Procrastination is not going to make it easier in another month. Invite them and ask them. Well, we're in our uh, fourth week of, uh, we're about to start our fourth week of Scripture readings. We've just finished our third, no, we've just finished our fourth. Help me with the math, 5, 10, 15, 16 to 20 this week. Uh, the message this week is from Matthew chapter 16. If you'd like to be turning there, let me give you some background. We're going to jump in at verse 27. Um, the disciples have been with Jesus for some time. They still don't fully understand um, exactly why Jesus came and the type of kingdom that he's establishing. They, they really haven't understood that. They're still looking for an earthly kingdom. They're still looking for a kingdom where Jesus is going to right all the wrongs that Israel has suffered at the hands of the Romans. They're still looking for a kingdom um, that's going to be advantageous to them because personally they expect to be given positions of power or authority in this kingdom. The problem with the disciples is they have made Jesus in their image. They've made Jesus to be the Messiah who's going to do what they want him to do and, and what's good and advantageous for them. Well, things are about to unravel. If you look back up in verse 21, if it hasn't been clear before, Jesus plainly states in verse 21 what, what is coming. He's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to suffer at the hands of the religious leaders. He's going to be killed and then on the third day be raised to life. Now, it seems like, if you look at the response, it seems like that all that they heard was that he was going to be killed. And of course, that upset the disciples. That, that dashed their hopes for the kingdom that they anticipated. That dashed their hopes and that, that dashed their plans. Jesus is not going to do what they wanted and what they hoped that he would do. Now, Peter... Uh, and before we, we beat on Peter too much, you have to know all the other disciples were thinking it. Peter's just the one that's foolish enough to open his mouth. Well, what's the old saying? Better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt? That's Peter. And so Peter, when Jesus says that he's going to be killed, that's all they hear. He says, look, uh, no way, that's not going to happen. God can't die. It's almost as if Peter is saying, we're not going to let that happen. We're not going to let you do that. And remember, Peter was the one in the garden who drew the sword, as if he could stop those hundreds that were there to arrest Jesus. Peter was the one who wanted to stop that. And look in verse 23. Jesus rebukes Peter, and he uses basically the same words he used when Satan was tempting him. You remember we covered the temptation a couple of weeks ago. 
He says to Peter, get away from me. Why? Satan's plan, just like in, in the temptation, Satan's plan all along before Jesus went to the cross, Satan's plan was to try to prevent Jesus from going to the cross so that we would not receive salvation. And so Jesus is basically responding to, to Peter, look, your thinking, your perspective is like Satan's, it's not like God's. Peter, Peter was thinking uh, from, from the viewpoint of unredeemed humanity. The viewpoint of unredeemed humanity is that we value the things of man or value the things of the world over the things of God. We want God to give us what we want. We haven't fully understood what it means to come to Christ. And you know, when it comes to God's will and plan and purpose, it's easy to slip into thinking and perspective that's, that's contrary to God's. Why? Because the way of discipleship is hard. Following Jesus is costly. Even for those of us who are redeemed, we're going to struggle with the right perspective all of our days. We have to willfully daily choose the things of God. We have to daily say to ourselves, get away from me. Well, following the rebuke of Peter, we come to these verses, 24 through 27, where Jesus is, is bringing even more clarity. He's explaining not only his self-denial and sacrifice, but he's about to explain the self-denial and sacrifice required for followers, for those who want to be a part of his kingdom. Look in Matthew 16 and verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. And so we see in this short passage, there are three elements of, of discipleship that Jesus reveals here. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. Well, first he says deny yourself. What, what does it mean to deny? The definition of deny is to refuse to recognize or acknowledge to disregard, to lose sight of, or to forget. Literally, it means to act like you don't know someone. When he says deny yourself, act like you don't know someone. It's exactly what Peter did in that courtyard. When Jesus was on trial, and you remember three times he was asked, did you know him? You sound like him. Were you with him? And he continually denied. He acted like he didn't even know him. Well, Jesus says deny yourself. Wait, wait a second, how, how do I act like I don't know me when I'm always with me? Well, maybe a better word is ignore. Ignore. Have you ever been out somewhere, maybe in public, and you see someone that maybe is not your best friend, and you avoid them or you act like you didn't see them? You ignore them? Pretend you don't see them, pretend you don't hear them. If they happen to holler across the parking lot at you, you just ignore them. You know, we have to ignore ourselves just in order to come to Christ. What, what do I mean by that? Well, you have to ignore your foolish thinking that says you're a good person and you're worthy of mercy and grace. You have to ignore that thought. You, you have to, to come to Christ, you have to ignore the belief that you have the ability to do anything good at all. So yourself is going to tell you that. You're a, you're a good person. Man, God would do well to have you in his kingdom. You have to ignore the thought that you could be good enough, that you could save yourself. You, you have to ignore your, your self-confidence, the idea that you can be anything or do anything good on your own. You have to ignore yourself to come to Christ, but then after you come to Christ... You have to continue that process of ignoring yourself. You have to ignore yourself when you want to pursue your own desires and your own selfish interests. You have to ignore yourself when you think uh, your way is best and you think you know what's best. You have to say to yourself, get away from me. That's what he's talking about when he says, deny yourself. You remember that when the disciples had first uh, come to Jesus, began to follow Jesus. You read about this in the first week of Matthew when Jesus called to them and he, he called them to follow him. They had to do that at the cost of complete abandonment. 
What did they leave? They left their nets and their family and their livelihood and their lifestyle and their, and their home. The only way to come to him was to come on his terms. They didn't bargain with him. Well, what's the memory verse this month? And he said to them, follow me and I will make you, what's the next word? Immediately. Immediately they left their nets and, and, and their life, all that that represented, immediately they left and they followed him. Well, they made that commitment. Now he's reminding them here and he's reminding us of that commitment. How do you come to Christ? You come to Christ by denying yourself, by self-denial. You recognize, I'm a sinful person, I'm under judgment, I'm condemned to spend eternity in hell, I can do nothing to change that, and so I'm going to ignore or refuse any thoughts to the contrary. I'm not going to listen to myself when myself says that I'm good enough, that I can do enough good things. I deny myself and I recognize I need a rescuer outside of me. And the only one who can rescue me is Jesus. And to come to Jesus, I have to reject my self-sufficiency and I have to surrender to him as Lord. Not just Savior, not just the one who forgives my sins, but is Lord of my life, the one I've given complete control to. And the problem is, although when we come to Christ, it's because we've come to a point of recognizing our, our need and all we come to Christ, and because we recognize our depravity and our great need, when we come to him, we say, hey, I'm all in, I'm, I'm fully submitted to you, eventually we begin to forget. And we start to pull back and re-exert some of our own rights and live life our way and pay attention to ourselves. Jesus is reminding the disciples and reminding us, reaffirming uh, our terms of surrender. When we come to Christ, we are his. Listen, to do with as he pleases. You see, when you surrender to Christ, you made yourself a slave to Christ. Well, I don't, I don't want to have to be a slave. Well, Scripture says you are a slave. If you're not a slave to Christ, you're a slave to sin and to Satan. You're not your own person. You're going to be a slave, and when you came to Christ, you said, I'm coming to Christ completely on his terms, and I'm surrendering to him as his slave. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, we no longer live, Christ lives in us. I have been crucified, we're going to talk about take up your cross in just a minute, I have been crucified with Christ, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Christ can't live in me if I don't ignore myself. Self-denial. Second thing he says right along with that is you have to take up your cross. Now, a lot of times people will look at that phrase, and I've even heard preachers preach on that phrase as being kind of metaphorical. Take up your cross. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, we know that Jesus took up his cross because that was the Father's will. Isaiah 53.10 says it was the Father's will to crush him. So Jesus took up his cross because it was the Father's will. Therefore, take up your cross can refer to simple submission to the Father's will. Whatever and wherever we're, we're submitted to his will. And taking up your cross is a good metaphor. We are to be surrendered and completely obedient to the Father's will. But can we be certain that it is simply a metaphor? In fact, can we say that we're completely surrendered to the Father's will, whatever and wherever, if we would not be willing to give our lives up, even to die, to make sure that his will is accomplished? Listen, for the disciples, this, this was no metaphor. It, it was clearly much more than that. Let me tell you what came to their mind when Jesus said, take up your cross. They lived under the Roman empire's rule and oppression. They had seen by this point in their lives uh, scores, if not dozens, of crucifixion. And here's a picture that was in their mind when Jesus said, take up your cross. The Romans, when they were going to crucify a criminal, the Romans would make that criminal do just what they made Jesus do, carry that, their, their own cross beam. They didn't carry the entire cross that was too heavy, but the beam that went across that their, their hands were nailed to, they made them carry that to, to shame them and humiliate them, but more importantly, to communicate that those who saw that criminal carrying the cross beam, that they were now under the submission and under the rule of the very government, the very ruler that they had been rebellious against. 
And so when Jesus said to the disciples, take up your cross, they pictured those condemned souls who were carrying their own instrument of crucifixion. And when Jesus said, take up your cross, he's basically saying, you're you're choosing to put yourself under the will of and in submission to the one to whom you once rebelled. It's a complete surrender. It was no metaphor for them. We know that at least eight of these 12 were martyred for their faith for carrying the gospel to other lands, for, for refusing to deny Christ. You know that in, in our day, and the estimates are hard to come by, but in our day, the estimates are somewhere between five and 10,000 believers are martyred for their faith every year. It's estimated that of the 2.3 uh, million Christians in the world, billion Christians in the world, 1.5 billion live in places of persecution and martyrdom. They don't consider this teaching metaphorical. They counted the cost before they made a commitment to Christ. Every week I receive a, an email update of the different people around the world who have been persecuted or lost their lives for their faith and how to pray for them and how to pray for their families. This week in, in uh, Odisha, India, there were 10 men who were accused back in 2008 of killing a Hindu leader. They didn't. It was just a way for the non-believers, the Hindus in their village, to turn against him. These men spent 10 years in prison. They were just released on bail, which means they could go back to prison, just released this week, 10 years away from their families, out of the ministry that they were doing, 10 years because they stood for Christ. In China, uh, many, you know, the, the Chinese church is, is phenomenal in growing in obeying the Lord, Chinese people are now reaching out to North Koreans with the gospel, and they're getting arrested, and they're being killed. It's not a metaphor to many people in our world. It's clear to them that when they deny themselves and take up their cross, they may literally have to give their lives up. Why do they do that? Well, they're, they're so enamored and so grateful for the gift of salvation that they will sacrifice everything, even to the point of their lives. Can I tell you that, that we in the church in the West are soft? And I think it's primarily because we don't really value like they do the gift of salvation. We take it for granted. And they are so grateful for it. They have so much gratitude. They're willing to give their very lives for the cause of the gospel. Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and then follow me. When when you leave yourself behind, when you crucify yourself, then what you need to do is cling steadfastly to me. You, You need to walk so close to me. Do you remember this? You need to walk so close to me that my dust gets all over you. What's he saying? You need to live like I live. You need to conform to my example. You need to imitate me in my living, in my suffering, even in my dying. You can't follow Jesus if you're not willing to deny yourself and and take up the cross. It's not about following Jesus sometimes and somewhere. It's about following Jesus all the time and everywhere. If you're not following Jesus all the time and everywhere, you're not following. You can't take follow me independent of deny yourself and take up your cross. Verse 25, he gives this warning. Look at verse 25. Whoever will save his life will lose it. He's saying if you have a strong desire to maintain your comfort and your security and your your health and and your happiness, if you have a strong desire for that, if, if you make this earthly temporal life your priority and you're unwilling to deny yourself and you're unwilling to, to sacrifice it all for me, then you're giving up your life in eternity. Now, don't misunderstand me here. Is he saying you lose your salvation? No, but it's certainly good for us to look at what he's saying here and ask the question, am I a true follower? The gate is narrow. The way is hard. Discipleship is costly. If we're not willing to deny and and to give up and to take up our cross to follow him, then we may not be a true follower. True follower. 
He says you can't preserve your life in eternity if you're trying to save or maintain your life in this age. What he's saying in Matthew 6, you, you can't serve two masters. You'll be devoted to one and hate the other, love the one, despise the other. Last week, you remember last week, we looked in 1 John chapter 2, don't love the world or the things of the world. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the desire to, to have and the desire to do and the desire to, to be, all those lusts, all that the world offers is passing away. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. Whoever loses his life for me will find it. And then in verse 26, we see the, the rationale for self-denial. He, he asks this question, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul. The logic of being willing to deny yourself and to take up your cross, even to the point of sacrificing your very life and, and follow Christ, the logic of that depends totally on the existence of eternal life and life beyond the grave. Do you believe it? Accumulating the goods and the pleasures of the world cannot secure eternal life. The goods and pleasures of the world are of the world. They're not part of God's kingdom, not part of God's economy. And if our focus is simply on that and how our life here can be comfortable, then we're not going to inherit, he says, eternal life. Listen, I don't, I don't have to tell you this. You, you've been to enough funerals. What you accumulate in this life does not go with you. You will never see a hearse. I saw several hearses this week. None of them had a trailer hitch. You know why? Because none of them are going to be hauling a U-Haul. That stuff's not going with you. Look at the question in verse 26. What will a man give? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? That question is for the one who has spent his time gaining the world instead of following Christ. And he asks that question for this reason. If you spend your time gaining the world instead of following Christ, and you get to the end and you realize you missed it, you can't buy your place in eternity. You can't buy salvation. So what if you gain the whole world at the moment you step across the threshold from time as we know it into eternity? All of that is gone. Nothing matters, and you can't now remedy the problem. Salvation does not come in eternity. It comes in the here and now by responding to Jesus' death and his resurrection with wholehearted commitment and discipleship and complete allegiance to him. He is Savior and Lord. You can't Commit to Christ and pursue the world. It's all or nothing. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Now, denying and, and taking up your cross and following Jesus is costly in this world. But look at the payout in verse 27. Jesus says that he's coming in all of his glory, and what's he going to do? He will repay or he will reward. You know that what, whatever you lose in this life, whatever you lose as a result of following him, whatever you suffer is to your credit or to your gain for all of eternity. Turn over just a few pages to uh, Matthew chapter 19. Look at the very end of Matthew chapter 19. Verse 29. He says, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and inherit eternal life. Jesus says he's going to repay a man for what he has done. What, what does that mean? For the practice of his faith, a look at the in, entirety of his life. Oh, there are times in all of our lives we, we take our eyes off Christ, we start listening to self. We don't want to take up our cross. We don't want to make sacrifice. There are times in all of our lives, but he's going to look at the entirety of our life and see whether or not we were a true disciple. You know, most of you in this room, 
have, have made some sacrifices along the way uh, earlier in life, later in life. You made some sacrifices along the way, knowing that you would get to some years of your life where you could no longer be as productive as far as work and, and earning income. And so you made some sacrifices along the way, and, and you invested in an IRA or 401k or annuity, whatever. You invested for the future, hoping to get a good return, which may or may not happen. But Jesus says when you invest in the things of the kingdom by denying yourself and taking up your cross and following him, when you invest in the kingdom, you're going to get a phenomenal return. We just read in Matthew 19 that he's going to restore all that and more. Does it mean you'll get those things physically? No, it means the blessing will be way beyond that. Remember what he said in Matthew 6? Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't corrupt and where thieves can't break in and steal. You've got to have a future mindset if you're truly going to be a follower of Christ and deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. You have to have an eternal mindset. It's, it's not easy following Jesus, is it? If you truly follow Jesus, it's not easy. And can I tell you, I told one of our staff guys just yesterday, we were talking about this, and I said, you know, death, dying for Jesus, sacrificing my life for Jesus is not the part that concerns me. It's the, the, the living part, the living for him every day. That's what's hard. You know, if you, if you give your all to Jesus, if you deny yourself, if you have to suffer and, and sacrifice for 70 or 80 or even 90 years, that's nothing compared to eons in eternity with him and the blessing and the reward you're going to receive. One final word, if you look back at the passage. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross, and this word is not in the ESV, but it's in the original Greek. It's the word daily. And, and that's the key. You have to deny yourself, and you have to take up your cross daily if you're going to follow Jesus. Now, why daily? We says take up your cross. He's talking about sacrificing yourself. You remember what Paul said in Romans 12? urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a what? A living sacrifice. It's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? I mean, you think of sacrifice, you think of something being killed. You think of the Old Testament, of the, 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 the lambs that were killed, the blood that was shed to, to cover the sins of the people for another year. You think of Christ's ultimate sacrifice and dying for us to not just cover our sins, but forgive our sins and wash our sins. When you think of sacrifice, you think of something dying. Paul says we're to be a living sacrifice. Why? Because a living sacrifice is very useful. A living sacrifice can do much for the kingdom, but the problem with a living sacrifice is on any given day, that living sacrifice can decide to get up off that altar and not be a sacrifice any longer. Daily, we, we have to choose to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow him. And when we do that, it certainly should be visible and have a visible impact in our lives. How we spend our time and how we spend our money and how we serve the Lord and his church and how we serve those in the world and how we relate to people, all of that, all of those evidences in our life should clearly show if we're denying self and taking up our cross and following him. That's what he's called us to as disciples. It's not to make Jesus in our image. It's not to want what we want. It's his way. And it's complete surrender to his way. Remembering that we are simply his slaves. We're his to do with as he will. If that means years of sacrifice, if that even means death, that's okay. Because we know what's to come in eternity. For the one who's willing to lose his life will save it.